Hello everyone and welcome to today's presentation titled How to Prepare Your Transport Network for the Next Big Disaster. Today's speaker is Randy Jenkins, Director of Business Development. During the presentation, please feel free to ask questions using the Q&A widget on your screen. At the end of the presentation, Randy will have a brief Q&A session and will review the submitted questions. If we do not answer your question during the session, we will be sure to respond via email after the presentation. Other widgets at the bottom of your screen include our speaker's bio, a link for submitting email inquiries, and a list of resources related to the presentation. This webinar is being recorded, and tomorrow you will receive an email with a link to the recording. Now with that, I'll hand it over to our speaker, Randy Jenkins. Thank you. Appreciate everybody attending today. We hope this will be a useful session for you. So let's go ahead and get into it. The uh, Sorry, the slides were out of order for a second here. The agenda for today's uh, webinar will talk about why backhaul networks need to be hardened. And then we'll look at two case studies from uh, 2018, the campfires in Northern California and Hurricane Michael in uh, Florida. And then we'll do a little summary of the findings from those case studies and then some specific recommendations on uh, how to configure your backhaul network. So just how reliable are mobile networks? Well, mobile networks actually have outages all the time. We've all kind of experienced that with our mobile service at some time. On the screen are, are two uh, charts that show uh, outages from outage.report, which is a web access. The yellow areas show one carrier's network outages in the morning of April 14th. And, the, and another one uh, shows the outages in the morning of April 18th. So we all know that mobile networks are extremely sophisticated with a combination of many different components and interwoven protocols. So it's not a surprise that there are issues on occasion that result in outages. So what causes them? This material came from a heavy reading study published in 2016 with inputs from 54 different mobile operators around the world. And we can see that network congestion is the biggest culprit, and the second is network failures that are really related to protocol issues. But the third item, physical link failures, are still significant. Physical link failures include the transport network, which is the subject of this webinar, so we'll focus in on them. From the same study, if we look at the portion of the physical network that suffers the most, clearly the RAN portion of the radio access network is the most complex and suffers the most outage problems. But the transport network is the second highest source of failures. And this gets even worse in times of disasters as the physical infrastructure takes a horrible beating. So we'll take a look at the physical beating in these case studies that will follow. We talk about disasters. How often and how devastating are these disasters that tend to destroy mobile network, mobile transport networks? This is a graph from NOAA showing years on the x-axis and the number of disasters on the left y-axis and the dollars, billions of dollars that the disasters cost on the, on the right y-axis. So you can see an increasing disasters rate over the years. So it's not a question of if more disasters are going to occur. It's only a question of how many and how soon. So we do have to ask ourselves a question of how well prepared are our mobile networks for this onslaught. Today, we see mobile networks becoming more like critical infrastructure than just appliances for ordering pizza and sharing photos. The loss of the network has different meaning in a commercial network, the loss is a temporary loss of service, perhaps a small loss of revenue for a short period of time, and some slightly disgruntled subscribers. But if we contrast that with critical infrastructure, what we see is the loss of the network leads to poor communication of the disaster, poor management of evacuations, weak and slow responsiveness of recovery efforts, and ultimately loss of lives. 
it's interesting to look at the statistics for use of wired phones in the U.S. today, especially in the context of alerting folks of an emergency or arranging evacuations, for example. And we can see from the statistics that it is very likely that most families will not get alerted of disastered disasters via their wired network, and they will have to rely on their mobile cellular network. So we can take a look at how the mobile coverage fared in the case studies that follow. Just how prevalent is this thinking that the mobile network is critical infrastructure? Well, in late last year, the FCC chairman was quoted as saying, broadband communications have become essential to the delivery of life-saving information in a disaster. It's critical to public safety that our broadband networks are as resilient as possible to prevent outages in a disaster and also can be restored as quickly as possible when an outage occurs. Subsequent to this, the FCC chairman established the Disaster Response and Recovery Working Group at the end of 2018. It's also interesting to note that with 5G coming, we'll see the use of the mobile network in many new applications. Some of them require much higher reliability than the mobile network provides today. So here are some use cases for 5G, and the highlighted yellow ones demand very high reliability. Public safety, healthcare monitoring, remote surgery, vehicle to vehicle, industrial automation, et cetera. Just who wants to be operated on when a surgeon is relying on information passed over the cellular network? Think about that for just a minute. So what can be done about hardening the network to limit the damage from these disasters? When we talk about site hardening, we tend to talk about power and the physical structure of the sites. But let's look at the transport network. Mobile networks are increasingly dominated by fiber in the U.S. market today. About 88% of all backhaul is from fiber and 12% is from microwave. So if we look at the choices for backhaul hardening, we see in the case of fiber, perhaps multiple fiber lines or fiber rings as a way to create hardening. In the case of microwave, uh, perhaps multiple microwave radios on the same path and physical struts, support struts for the, struts for the microwave antennas allowing them to withstand higher winds or a combination of fiber and microwave is another way to look at it. But if we look at the challenges, we realize the number one challenge is that the costs on these sites becomes very, very important. Mobile operators are for-profit businesses, and as they spend more money on hardening, that's less money that they'll make on those sites. So we can't forget that these are for-profit networks. At times, fiber or microwave just isn't possible. So even though if you want to have fiber, you might not be able to get it, or if you want to have microwave, you may not be able to provision microwave because of some obstacles in the way, perhaps. And in many cases, the cost of fiber leasing or the implementation of fiber just may be extremely high, uh, cost prohibitive, essentially. In reality, fiber diversity is typically very confusing and often the wording is misused. Often fiber, multiple fiber strands are utilized, but they run through the same conduit buried in the ground or on the same telephone poles or power poles in the air or along the same side of the street for a distance, which means that all of the fibers are going to suffer from the same failure mechanism, whether it's a backhoe operator or winds or whatever. Aerial fiber tends to get knocked down because of uh, high winds. The poles get knocked down or the poles uh, or trees uh, uh, drop across the lines and rip the lines, or they could be burned in fires. Typically, these are large area problems. So a lot of times the redundancy that we think about being available for fiber, it happens that it doesn't actually play out that way because of the large area problem disaster 
buried fiber suffers from uh, backhoe damage, typically the number one failure mechanism where a backhoe operator digs a hole in the ground and cuts through fiber. You can also have flooding junction boxes and rodents for some reason like to chew on fiber. So there's a variety of failure mechanisms associated with fiber. On the microwave side, there are a variety as well, but microwave diversity is almost always utilized. It's a very cost-effective option when using microwave to have two radio channels pointing down the same path. And the failure mechanisms tend to yield very quick repairs with microwave. If you have two radios on one path and one radio fails, the other one picks up in milliseconds. Um, if the antennas are blown off of access by very high winds, the radio link tends to continue operating at a slightly degraded state. If you do have complete loss of power, including the backup power, or if the tower is blown over, then the microwave system obviously won't work. But in that case, you've lost the cell site, so it's kind of a moot point. So let's shift gears and look at a couple case studies in 2018 disasters and, and look at how the transport network responded and how that affected network performance. So the campfire in Northern California was named after a road, the Camp Creek Road, where the fire started. And it moved rapidly from the northeast, quickly reaching the town of Paradise and overrunning it. The amazing thing is the fire was moving at a rate of 80 football fields per minute. So firefighters, there was no way they could keep up with it. It was two days before the telco workers were given access to the area to try and assess damage and deal with the recovery, obviously. During that time, a lot of people were unaccounted for, some 850 people. There were no communications to help anybody find them. There's a lot of damage statistics at the bottom of the page, but by far the worst was that 85 casualties came out of this horrible event. If we look at the map again, the yellow stars are just some of the cell sites from one particular carrier. They had more cell sites, but we use these just to illustrate the findings. All but two of the sites were fiber fed, and the two sites that were uh, fed with microwave were near Orville Dam at the bottom of the picture, and they were unaffected by the fire. The fiber was aerial fiber, and it was provided by a combination of AT&T and Comcast in this particular area. In total, this one carrier had 15 sites that went off the air. It's kind of ironic that the sites continued operating for some time as they had battery backup, which is good for between four and eight hours. But they had no backhaul network for the traffic to go anywhere, so it clearly wasn't operating. You can see also the red site uh, down near Orville Dam, and we've labeled it the protected high site. This was just a high tower on top of a small mountain that had fiber at its base and a whole bunch of microwave radios on it already. It was a magnificent line of sight from that location, so it was a very popular site. It was agreed upon between the telco workers and the firefighters that that site would be protected from fire in any case. Luckily, it was never threatened, but if it was, they would have uh, spent a lot of energy and time to try and keep it from getting burned. This concept of a high site is important, and, and we'll discuss it in the second case study as well. So this high site is about 11 to 12 miles from the city of Paradise, and they were able to get microwave to easily reach Paradise from that site to deliver hundreds of megabits capacity. Now SATCOM was, is absolutely critical in disaster response and disaster recovery, but it has its limitations. Capacity and reliability are both in question. You need high capacity due to site documentation, site photos, data sharing, et cetera, as restoration efforts uh, are ongoing. And that requires hundreds of megabits data rate with reliable connections. Microwave provides that. And during the disaster, Sat SATCOM didn't because of smoke and particulate in the air. So microwave was brought in quickly to reestablish communications. Aviat shipped 14 microwave radio links overnight, and eight of those links were installed within 72 hours. It took about three weeks to get most of the fiber temporarily restored, 
the two microwave links stayed up for over two months longer because of fiber issues. With over a thousand telephone poles needing to be replaced, it certainly takes time to restore the uh, transport, the fiber optic transport network. So if we step back in time just a little bit and we look at after the California North Coast fires of 2014-2015, AT&T announced that widespread outages were a thing of the past with self-healing fiber networks that protected from outages, geographic diversity to over 91% of the fiber was put in place. Unfortunately, fire outages apparently were not factored into that equation. In October 2017, only a year later, the Napa fires occurred, and you can see the results at the bottom of the page. Needless to say, the fiber network did not fare well. No matter how well designed and implemented, the fiber networks continue to be a significant source of failure during these disasters. So can sites and transport networks actually be hardened and live through disasters? Well, let's quickly look at the state of Colorado land mobile network. This is the network that serves emergency communications for fire, police, ambulance services. And you can see from the pictures the burned equipment and sites, but they kept working. No sites went off the air until they exhausted their battery backup or diesel generator fuel. The state was able to communicate with their emergency teams most of the time and critically in the early stages of the emergency as the emergency strategy was enacted. They used concrete shelters, all indoor radios with only passive elements outdoor. The fires just discolored everything and moved on. As soon as the diesel generators or batteries were replenished, the sites were fully operational again. So it can be done. So if we move on to the second case study, let's take a look at Hurricane Michael in Florida. The carrier we interviewed had all their cell sites fiber connected in Panama City area, and the fiber was all above ground. Needless to say, the onslaught of 155 mile an hour winds took a toll on trees, telephone, power poles, and of course the fiber network. Temporarily, fiber was laid on the ground, but repair crews clearing massive debris couldn't take the time to differentiate between wires lying, laying on the ground and the temporary fiber was cut, relayed, and recut, and this was repeated numerous times. 20 links of Aviat microwave were transported by truck to the scene and were installed within three days, restoring communications to the area. Again, horrible statistics, and the worst was the 57 deaths that came from this disaster. This map shows the temporary microwave installed with the red markers on the map, and the green lines are the paths of the microwave radios. In this case, for this one operator, five cows, or cells on wheels, were installed, and the rest were reestablishment of service from macro sites that could be brought back to life. Only three towers were completely destroyed, but many more were mangled. You weren't able to climb them, but they were able to still attach microwave radios to them and get them to operate just fine. Some key takeaways from the microwave radio install included the need to simplify as the avail availability of skilled climbers was limited, and many were not completely familiar with microwave radios, leading to rework and delays. Also, radios had to be kitted, and one day was spent accomplishing that task, but when they got to sites, they still were missing minor components resulting in trips to stores like Home Depot to get some of the basic parts that were missing. SATCOM worked fine in terms of reliability in this case, but congestion was a serious problem. It seemed like everybody wanted to be on SATCOM, not a surprise, and the data rate certainly didn't support the needs of restoration activities. Microwave radios, again, provided hundreds of megabits reliable throughput to support the restoration progress. We talk about the concept of protected high sites in the previous case study. Here we see the high sites are actually inland, inside the red circle. The winds abate quickly over land, so often these towers that are inland suffer no damage whatsoever. 
and further inland, the towers tend to be tall, providing excellent line of sight back to the coastal areas. Again, in this case, microwave can provide hundreds of megabits reliably over 6 to 10 miles to get back into the city from these high sites. <coughs> so how do we respond most effectively to the next disaster? Well, one thing we do is we plan microwave equipment in advance, store it to be ready to go. Critical issues include the time it takes to get equipment together once on the sites and the complexity of the initial setup and installation. Certainly given the challenges of the skilled labor that are in, it's in very high demand around these times. So we have to make the solution as easy as possible. We limit the solutions to the best ones possible. All components fit into one kit one link in one kit so it can be dispersed to the appropriate sites without a lot of thought. If we choose the right frequency, then we can cover the right distances with the highest capacities possible. So these microwave kits can be stored in a centralized location and ready to ship in a minute's notice. And then, of course, after the radios are no longer needed, they can be shipped back to the depot for replenishment and or refurbishment and prepare them for the inevitable next event. So in summary, some key takeaways, commercial cellular networks are increasingly becoming critical infrastructure. I made mention earlier about the FCC establishing the Disaster Response and Recovery Working Group under the Broadband Deployment Advisory Committee in November of 2018. And we saw that with 5G, there's even more demands placed on the network for reliability. Currently, the commercial cellular networks are not able to withstand environmental disasters. These two disasters that we looked at are just a snapshot of what happened in 2018. In each case, the mobile network failed to support the critical needs of the public. Fiber networks are a critical weak point in these networks. Fiber strands break, they get burned, they get broken again. The failure mechanisms are many and the repair time frame can be lengthy. Microwave radio backhaul is able to withstand environmental disasters better and enable recovery much faster. Microwave radio protection is well understood, very cost effective in contrast to fiber. The first thing mobile operators do when a disaster approaches is to look at their inventory of microwave radios, get on the line with the microwave vendors to see that they're available, see what they have available for immediate shipment. And lastly, microwave radios used in recovery must be simple and quick, easy to install in order to enhance recovery time. Microwave radios are complex, like any electronics, but by making good choices, we can simplify the solution and allow for a quick response. So two simple recommendations associated with uh, disaster preparedness. The first one is to pre-position microwave radio backup at high sites. We talked about this concept of high sites. Operators should evaluate their networks and overlay microwave only on these high sites to support evacuations and recovery. We can't use microwave for fiber backup everywhere because of cost. <coughs> but we can select critical high sites in areas that are likely to be affected by disasters and deploy microwave in those times in advance. And secondly, Maintain an inventory of microwave radios for recovery operations. We can choose optimal frequencies and configurations. We can simplify the solution. We can house those radios in reusable cases and ship them overnight and then reuse them again after it's done. Thank you. Thanks, Randy. Um, we'll now begin our Q&A portion of the webinar. Please submit your question in the chat box on your dashboard. Um, we'll try to get to as many questions as we can during the time remaining. But if we do not get to, your answer, to answer your question today, we will send you an email directly with a response. All right, first question, what are the survival rates of buried versus aerial fiber? It seems like a lot of the issues uh, weren't weren't associated with buried fiber, and that is correct. Uh, buried fiber does live through these disasters a lot better than aerial fiber. 
uh, you just don't have buried fiber everywhere. So it's going to be a toss-up whether you have buried or aerial fiber at a particular location. Uh, they still have their, their challenges living through the disasters, but they're not nearly as bad as uh, aerial fiber. Uh, a, another question, it's actually a comment and provided by uh, uh, the county of Napa. So one of the gentlemen who actually work in that network said that the Napa safety uh, radio network stayed up during the fires with only one hour of downtime. Uh, microwaves saved our operations throughout the fire. So like we mentioned in the state of Colorado, uh, public safety networks tend to be dominated by microwave and microwave tends to live through these disasters a little bit better. So thank you very much, Casey, for that comment. Uh, question, uh, were STAs required to put up the campfire microwave links? Yes, uh, STAs are uh, a license because all of these radios are licensed radios. Um, uh, actually, we have another question about unlicensed, so we'll talk about that for just in just a moment. But uh, you can get authorization basically overnight from the FCC uh, to get a temporary license to put up a licensed microwave radio link. This is all common process. Uh, you've got to get used to it, but once you've done it, it's pretty straightforward and you can get uh, STAs approved very, very quickly uh, to get licensed microwave up. Specifically, uh, unlicensed uh, radios are uh, another option uh, instead of using licensed radios. The downside, the, the positive of license, unlicensed radios is that uh, you don't have to get a license for it, so you can skip the STA process, even though it is very, very simple and straightforward, and, and the federal government works very quickly to resolve that, but still you could save a little bit more time by using unlicensed. The problem with unlicensed is that you just don't know what kind of interferers you're gonna have, so it's kind of a, you know, uh, a, a, a difficult decision to make. Certainly having a handful of unlicensed radios in your portfolio as part of your solution kit makes sense, but we wouldn't suggest relying on uh, just unlicensed radios as part of your uh, recovery kit. Another question, uh, does Aviat have unlicensed IRU 600 in the V4 platform, the latest version of the all indoor radio, and yes, there is uh, an unlicensed capability uh, built into that radio. It's not as broad uh, coverage in the frequency band as we used to have because uh, the FCC rules changed, and it, it, I'm not exactly sure 100%, but I think the band edges uh, perhaps had to move in a little bit more, be protected more, or something along those lines. Uh, but there's definitely a uh, capability in that platform to use uh, the IRU radio as an unlicensed radio uh, for temporary use, and then you can transfer it over to a licensed radio once your spectrum is available. Thank you for that question. Uh, can you share the slides after this presentation and put a link to the video so we can watch again? Uh, yes, the, the video will be sent out to you uh, by our marketing department, or a link to the video will be sent out to you. And if you go down to the bottom of the window, um, I believe there is a resources window, and, um, and you can pull up the slides. Is, is that correct, Monica? Yes, and I can also send them um, to everyone afterward. So. Um, another question, uh, some areas have very limited access to high sites. Example, you provided are close to mountains or flat with uh, limited tall trees. How about high sites in areas in the northeast where 100-foot cell towers are challenging, challenged in zoning? You know, great question. Uh, microwave radio really wants to see line of sight uh, in order to get a reliable performance. If you clip the signal a little bit and you and you lose a little bit of that signal you can still get the radio to work and in times of disaster recovery perhaps uh, you know a, a little bit of capacity is better than having no capacity at all but we'd certainly be suggesting that you would be looking for uh, a very very high 
locations where you could pre-position microwave and you would know that you would get good line of sight from that. In those areas where that's not achievable, you probably need to go looking for uh, another solution. Uh, but, but we've seen uh, a number of instances where high sites are achievable and those, uh, those sites could, could utilize pre-positioned microwave. Are there any special design in microwave equipment uh, by Aviat for rescue purposes? Um, there, there really isn't. Uh, I mean, what we talked about is taking a generic radio and just making the choices. Microwave radios today have a tremendous number of options associated with them, capacity and protocols and channel sizes and frequencies and et cetera, et cetera. So I think uh, the, the, the key take, takeaway in terms of the equipment is to take what's available and make optimal choices. Think about those choices ahead of time. What capacities do you want to pre-program everything to? What channel sizes? What frequencies? Uh, what capabilities do you want to have in place? associated with the radios so that you can get them up and running uh, as fast as possible without having to make decisions and delaying response on the ground. So other than that, there really isn't anything unique in the design of the radio uh, that, that, that fits this application. It's really just thinking about how you use it as best uh, or optimally. Um, there's a question about um, this concept of high sites and, and aligning antennas. Um, when a, a product that's available is a electromechanical uh, alignment uh, device, and it basically is a, a motorized uh, SNMP controlled device that you can mount your antennas on, and you can from afar be able to adjust. Uh, the pan and tilt of that device so that you basically can align your antennas. So you could see yourself uh, setting up a network and uh, doing your alignment at the far end at the high site uh, using that device perhaps, and then now you only have to adjust the, uh, the antenna for the alignment on your cow or on your temporary vertical infrastructure. Uh, that you have. Uh, so doing that would probably save you some time and make it a little bit easier uh, to get that alignment. And I believe that these alignment uh, devices or these mounting, electromechanical mounting devices have a tremendous amount of, of pan and tilt in terms of uh, degrees. So you could actually move them and, and point at different, uh, different towns in the distance uh, depending on whether or not you wanted to hook up to this one or that one. Are emergency radio kits reusable? Uh, yes, uh, to a point. Uh, our expectation is that there are some pieces of equipment in that emergency kit that are probably going to be uh, quote unquote lost, consumed, uh, broken, whatever, during the installation and need to be uh, replaced as part of the kit. And these are not expensive items. They may be their jumper cables or their connectors, uh, or they're a small tool that you use. Uh, so those are the things that probably need to be inventoried, and when the kit comes back, need to be restocked in the device. But it's important that all of those things, every last bit of componentry, be restocked in that kit, because otherwise you've got got delays, and like I mentioned in the one situation that guys had to drive off to Home Depot to get some components, uh, uh, cabling I believe in this instance, uh, that, that were missing and they had forgotten about, and we want to try and avoid that. We'd like to get the network back up and running as soon as possible and, uh, and be able to make sure that, that more lives can be saved and more people can be protected. And I think that's it for questions. Does anybody have any more?
Okay, I think that's it, Randy. So um, thank you so much again, Randy, for answering all those questions. And this will conclude our webinar for today. Remember, we will be sending out a recording via email tomorrow, and we'll also be sure to include the slides. So thank you so much for attending, and goodbye.